Okay, here we go, and welcome back. And um, we're doing our deep explorations into the labyrinth. We're going to kind of regroup a little bit where we've been and then get on. But two things I wanted to share with you, and I wanted to kind of put this, record this because <coughs> of the interest. I don't know how many of you saw, but in, there's an Associated Press article this morning, and this is December the 29th, 1996 for what is about to come down. I think that those of you who are sitting here and those of you who have come along with us on television and these tapes and everything should take some consolation in this. That, and I don't know how, there's no way I can prove to you that what I'm telling you has been the truth. Um, you know, other than as you experience it, I know it makes sense to you, uh, which God should make sense, and God does make sense. But th these things that are, are happening now are, I should give you some encouragement about the credibility of what you're listening to and what you're involved in. Um, it's in the Asbury Park Press, but this is uh, Associated Press, December 29th. And the headline is, Science Focuses on Stars and Mars in Search for Far-Off Life. And I, let's, I'll just read you a couple of paragraphs. It is easy to reduce this year's science events to three words, life on Mars. But that would be a mistake. When NASA scientists said in summer they had found evidence for life on the red planet, they added but an episode to this year's hottest scientific drama, a continuing saga as spine-tingling as the X-Files, a scientific revolution so significant it is changing our conception of life in the universe. In the last year, and this, I think, make you feel good. A number of findings have all but convinced scientists that life is not just a freak ac accident that could only happen on Earth, but an ubiquitous and irrepressible part of the universe. It's every bit as profound as the revolutions that were brought about by Copernicus and Darwin on our place in the universe, said Stephen Squares of the University in Ithaca. And it's not just the famous potato-sized meteorite bearing chemical signs of microbe metabolism. Uh, perhaps, and then it, it talks about if life survived under those conditions, where else in the universe could it be hiding? Now this part I want you to pay attention to. Perhaps near one of the nearby stars that are now known to have planets circling them. That's the eight. Only one such planet was known at this time last year. But now there are about a dozen, several of which appear hospitable to life. And you found, and you sat in this room as we tracked the announcement of each one of them, okay? Now, all of a sudden, these planets are being highlighted as the ones that are special. And remember, that's part of the symbol that was given to the Coptics. Closer to home, the Galileo spacecraft has been exploring a little-known corner of the solar system that could harbor life. The spacecraft is going to take a close look at Jupiter's moon, Europa, which some researchers consider even more promising than Mars as a potential garden spot. And researchers also got a clearer sense this year of how life develops. <coughs> the genetic analysis of an ancient microbe revealed secrets about how the tree of life is organized. Understanding these organisms is going to get us a lot closer to understanding the origin of life, but it won't answer the question of whether life originated here or someplace else. Take that again now. Listen very carefully to what he said. This is Greg Venter of the Institute for Mnemonic Research. It won't answer the question of whether life originated here or someplace else. Now, I will answer the question for you. Life as you know it, look at each other, originated someplace else. Uh, this question became a little more interesting when a paper in the journal Nature presented evidence that rocks from Greenland hold chemical evidence that life existed 3.85 billion years ago. <laughs> and then going down to the end of it, now this is another thing that I think most of you were here as we went through the eight planets. How significant is this? How important is this? How important is our Pegasus series? Listen to this. <coughs> Maybe even tough enough to develop in some of the newfound worlds around distant stars, life. This year, two stars, 47 Ursa Major, an old friend, and Leland 21185, that's Leo, that's planet number seven, have been discovered to have Jupiter-like planets that could harbor life. Now, 
what's important about this and should be important to you, that we went and we tracked each one of these planets. And now this newspaper article from the Associated Press is talking about the um, uh, uh, number of planets, new planets around sun stars that have been discovered in the last year and specifically named Ursa Major, <coughs> which I think was number three, and Leo, which was number seven. And then this is the last paragraph in this particular article. William Cochran, astronomy professor at the University of Texas in Austin, Texas. All of this actually shows us that we're not very special. Any time that we've thought that we here on our Earth and our solar system and our sun have been special in any way, we have been proven wrong. So um, I, I felt that this was very interesting and, and very encouraging and, and it should make you feel pretty good because well, a lot of people have been yelling, what have you been doing down there and what kind of nuts are down in that basement? The Associated Press now is naming the very stars that we have been studying, the very planets that we have been studying, and say these may hold the secret and the key, and, and more than likely do. And um, I, I somehow would love to be able to get to one of these people. Maybe I'll drop a line or something and tell them that, you know, they should do some looking at 4555 in the galaxy coma. Now, <clears throat> last week, in addition, uh, everybody here was real nice and provided me with a uh, Stedman's Medical Dictionary on CD-ROM computer, so we, we can get the stuff a lot faster. And uh, you know. um, I wanted to, I've already come up with some stuff. I just started pushing in, you know, and it just flies, you know, the stuff, and it prints it out. <clears throat> One of the things that I found, I just thought I'd, I'd share this with, with you before we talk. One of the things that I found is something in your head called Pyramid of Light. And what is interesting, um, I, I, as again, can't make copies. I'll leave it on the floor if you want to look at it. <laughs> but it's a triangular area at the front part of the tympanic membrane, which you said is the ear hearing, running from the umbo to the periphery, where there is seen a bright reflection of light, a cone of light, a luminous cone. I just thought that was interesting. But there's a pyramid of light in your head. The other thing which I found interesting is something called hippocampus, which is in the brain. And this is a complex structure that forms the medial margin of the cerebral hemisphere, your brain. Well, what's very interesting about this, and Joan brought it to my attention, it says <coughs> the complex that forms the medial margin, and then they define the word medial margin <coughs> as hem. The medial margin hem of the cortical mantle of the cerebral hemisphere, your brain. And when Joan saw this, and we're thinking of, you know, Amen and God and Christ consciousness and God consciousness and the higher mind, and then we see in the Bible where the lady said, if I could but just touch the hem of the garment, of the garment yeah. then I would be healed. Yeah. Wow. See? Yeah, you did that one. If I could just touch, so basically what's being said here, if, if we're right, if I could just touch that consciousness. Now, now, now why is that interesting? If that stood alone, and I saw, you know, that's interesting. But let me show you why that's interesting. <coughs> and as I said, I'll lay this on the floor so you can look at it. There are two gyri, G-Y-R-I, which are rounded, <coughs> elevated things in the brain. One of these is called almond's horn. And this is in your brain. This is in your brain. In your brain is almond's horn. And when you look the word almond, almond is A-M-M-O-N, the Egyptian deity, God. Almond. Which you know as almond. <laughs> what is so interesting about this is that if this is God's horn in your brain, 
The horn is a symbol in metaphysics of power. <clears throat> so then we have God's power labeled in your brain. So one, <coughs> one of the two interlocking parts composing the hippocampus, which is the part of your cerebrum or your brain, is called Amun's horn. And Amun is God. <coughs> Amen. Um, another interesting part of it, it says, <coughs> its major connection, and a lot of big words, and transfer and scepter, by way of the fornix, it portrays to the septum, by way of the fornix, and which, you know, is the cave or the vault that you find in, in your, your things. So I thought that was really interesting. And then one last thing that I, <coughs> what I, is that, yeah, that's a, I come up with a, a little bit of the something. Uh, one last thing that is interesting, when you look at Amun, God, Amun, Let's look at A-M-U and N, okay? The reason that is A-M-U stands for atomic mass unit. That's a, a symbol of atomic mass unit. So the connection of Amen and Atom, the connection <coughs> of Amen and Amen in the brain, you know, is again amplified as we look at another part of the brain which is the hippocampus hippocampus okay um, did you have do you have the thing from last week okay both of you have one okay would you uh, just skip one all right <clears throat> so those are very interesting things and it's amazing in this, in this computer age how <coughs> we go through books and study all of these things. And now, you know, I'm sitting there yesterday hitting buttons and, and, and then instantly gathering up everything. <coughs> so, let me see where we're at. If you have the stuff. We have pretty well arrived, and I won't go into detail with all of this stuff, but if you want to, if you have a pencil or a pen, and you want to write on the front sheet, I'll give you the scriptures, all right? We have pretty much solidly drawn the uh, connection of cherubim in the Bible and cerebrum in your head. The cerebrum in your head, your brain, and the cherubim in the Bible are one and the same. <coughs> you have a pencil, you want it real quick. Exodus 2520. Exodus 2519. First Samuel 4:4. Ezekiel 10.3, Ezekiel 41.18, and 1 Kings 6.27. 6.27. We then look, and on page 2 of that stuff that I gave you, I'm going to refer to it as the stuff. As we were looking inside of the brain where the cherubim are, we looked at the Ark of the Covenant and we defined the word Ark on page 2. And on page 2 you found that the Ark was an electric current between two or more separated electrodes, etc. And so that we said then the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony, is not a box in your head, but it's an electrical arc caused by an angle of light which you refer to as an angel of light, <laughs> that causes the arc between the two electrodes in the brain, the two receptors in the brain, the, the brain receptors. And that arc is um, in Hebrews 9.4, in Exodus 16.34. <coughs> so 
the almond part that I gave you, and uh, I don't think the person, the lady in the second, uh, third row there, she didn't get this. The almond part <coughs> was important because, if you remember, one of the things in the holy place or the ark <coughs> was Aaron's rod that budded almond. And we looked on page, um, the almond I would put in as 2A and 2B in your stuff. Hmm. But in 2A, the almond referred us to the word containing amyg amygdalin. And on 2B, we found amygdala to be connected to speech the larynx pharyngeal area. So then we realized that the importance of the rod that blossomed into almond inside of our brain would be as this arc and the receptors are ignited would give us the understanding to be able to speak the truth and to be able to bring enlightenment to people. <coughs> and that's on Hebrews 9.4. Now, on page 3, we got to the point of the arc of the testimony, which was interesting because we found that the energy began in the genital area, which goes up the spine through the solar plexus to impact at the pineal gland of the brain. We then, on page 3, found the word testes, and we found it means not only the male sexual organ, but also, as you can see on page 3, it means to give witness. On page 3, the scriptures are Hebrews 9.4, Genesis 24.2, Exodus 16.34. <clears throat> and you remember, what that was about is that Abraham had his friend put his hand under his thigh and swear. And in those days, rather than putting their hand over their heart, they put their hand on the male the sexual area. And so the word testy means both male sexual organ and to give witness. And so that was the arc of the testimony. And what is so interesting and important about that is that the um, energy that rises from the base of the spine rises from the genital area, the testicle genital area, and then rises up to the solar plexus area up the spine to impact on the pineal gland. We found the other thing <clears throat> that was in the ark, which is in your brain, and all of this stuff is in your brain, you can forget anything else, was manna. <coughs> and we found on page four of the stuff I gave you, manna being a saccharine exudation, manite meaning sugar. Okay? <coughs> we then found on page Five, the next page on the stuff, I, incidentally, uh, the scriptures on manna are Exodus 3.8 and Exodus 16.15. Next page, we found that brain sugar is something called galactose. And as you can see on page five, galactose, brain sugar. Once again, it's Exodus 3.8, Exodus 16.15. On page 6, <coughs> we looked and we found galactic, which is a root of that word galactose. Galact means milk. And tell sugar, so we had milk and sugar, or a milky, sugary substance in your brain. And then we realized that the Bible says, I will bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Okay? Interesting, too, that galactose, which is brain sugar, and milk, <laughs> has its root of the word galaxy. And our galaxy is the Milky Way. Milky Way. Okay? So everything is connected. <clears throat> We then got to the point of the 12 rods 
that were placed in the tabernacle, and we realize the importance of that <coughs> because we see on page 7 of the stuff that I gave you that in your brain you have 12 cranial nerves. That's in Numbers chapter 17, verse 2, about the 12 rods. So if you write down Numbers chapter 17, verse 2 on page 7 of your stuff, and then when you sit with people and you show them the reason there's 12 rods, the reason there's 12 signs of the zodiac, the reason there's 12 constellations in the ecliptic, the reason there's 12 tribes of Israel, the reason there's 12 disciples of Jesus is because we have 12 cranial nerves in our brain. You don't have 13, you don't have 11, you don't have 6, you don't have 5, you got 12. And the reason is you are the plug to plug into the outlet, which is the universe. And at just a moment ago, we read what's going on today, <laughs> which I read in the Associated Press. The scientists are on the verge of discovering the places where all these people live, people that you have called angels. And they're simply angles of light which trigger a receptor in your brain so you can see these people who live at a different frequency than you are. You're on channel 13, they're on channel 77. You get hit with an angle of light, the receptor opens up and you're kicking into channel 77 and there they are. That's a big deal. You do it all the time on television, you don't think twice of it. None of this stuff is a big deal to people. I mean, you're talking about people who are just more advanced than you are. I mean, this Bible, as we're proving to you, was written about your brain, about the universe, about atomic energy, about the speed of light, about all of this stuff written by people who are 6,000 years advanced beyond where you're at. And they live at a different frequency. And your frequency, as I said, is on channel 13 and they're on channel 77. So, I mean, try to see. If you turn on, if your TV only gets up to channel 13, you're not going to see Larry King, who's up on channel 46 somewhere. You have to be able to get up to that frequency. <laughs> and so you do that when you're impacted by an angle of light, what you call an angel of light, and that happens as you get deeper into this meditation. But you're not just going to be able to meditate and get this any more than you're going to be able to meditate about driving a car and get a license. You have to be able to prove to the authorities that you can drive that car. They don't want you on the street messing around with something as powerful as that, and you don't know what you're doing. Well, there's somebody by the name of God that does not want you messing around with this unless you know what's going on. And I'm trying to explain to you what's going on. Once you understand what's going on, once you understand how this works, you'll be given that power to use it. You'll pass the test. And you'll meet Samahel. <coughs> okay. Um, now, one of the things that is interesting that we, we were looking at last week is, of course, in Exodus, God told Moses, I want you to make the tabernacle, and I want you to make it according to a plan, because it's a pattern of something else that exists. And he says, I want you to make the outer court, and I want you to make the holy place, the holy of holies, and I want you to separate the outer court from the holy place by the web or the curtain. No big deal. Very big deal. <clears throat> Very big deal because in Stedman's Medical Dictionary, we find that your brain, that thing, just put your hand up. It's, just, it's sitting on top of your shoulders right now. You can't see it, but you can feel it. It's there. It has an outer covering called dura mater, which means hard mother. It has an inner place called pia mater, which is tender mother. That's the holy place. And pia mater of your brain is separated from the dura mater of your brain by arachnoid. And arachnoid is the web or the curtain. So then the Bible gives us an anatomically correct description of the human brain, written thousands of years ago. <laughs> when there was nobody, you know, the, the, this stuff is not written by sheep herders or people hanging out in, you know, some strange place. These, this is written by very sophisticated intellectual people who place this stuff there waiting for you to evolve to the point where you can finally say, aha. It's just like all of these planets that the Asbury Park Press and all these places are saying were discovered last year. They've been there all the, all the time. It's just that we evolved to the point where we were able to develop the equipment to see them. <coughs> okay. So here then we have a rock where we have the web. Now there's an interesting thing here. That's the tabernacle in the Bible. 
This is the tabernacle in your brain. Remember Dr. Gerald Goddard of, uh, Gerald Tuller of the Goddard Space Laboratories said that the universe is like the human brain. 10% of it is visible, 90% of it is invisible. Which then leads me to think, what is the World Wide Web, really? And uh, you talk about communication and intergalactic things which you're about to embark on and you're about to see for yourself. Uh, I think you'll, you'll have to come back to this place that you heard this here and found out, my God, there is a connection. And this is a connection that there's no priest, minister, pope, whoever has a clue that this exists. And yet, nonetheless, it's a fact. Nonetheless, we, we document it <coughs> with steadfast. Now, I want to show you something. What's interesting here? And that is if you will turn to page seven of the stuff, I, page eight of the stuff I gave you. <coughs> You'll see there the membranes of the cord. That's your spinal cord. And if you look under the word structure, it says the pia mater of the cord is exposed by the removal of the arachnoid. Arachnoid is the web. You could say also that in the Bible, the holy, the most holy place, the holy of holies, is exposed by the removal of the curtain. And if you remember in the Bible, when Jesus was crucified, it says the veil was rent in two. In other words, the arachnoid was removed. And we'll, we'll, I'll explain this as we go along. But the curtain is removed, which exposes the holy place. The arachnoid is removed, which exposes Pia Mater, tender mother. All right? Now, the interesting point that I wanted to bring to your attention here was under structure, down here in the second paragraph, the Pia Mater of the cord is less vascular in structure, but thicker and denser than the Pia Mater of the brain, with which it is continuous. <laughs> That's very important. Because when you talk about kundalini or the energy that raises itself up the spine and enters the brain, it's not really happening. It's all one. The spine and the brain are, are one unit. Pia mater, dura mater, arachnoid of the brain. Pia mater, dura mater, arachnoid of, of, of the uh, spinal cord are not two separate things. They are one thing running together. It's one entire unit. So that when you have that energy coming up the spine, Naturally, it's going to find its way up to the pineal gland of the brain. It is one expressive thing. It is one unit. See, the brain and the spine are not two different units. So the rod, then, that we, as we found in the scriptures, Aaron's rod must be in the tabernacle since the rod and the tabernacle, the spine and the brain are one. <clears throat> Let me go back to it for just a second. If you remember, the spine, your spine is the rod. That's the rod that Moses was holding. And when Moses said, I can't do this, I can't, I can't figure this out, it's like we say in religion, I don't, I don't know how to touch God, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say. And God said to Moses, what have you got in your hand? He says, I got the rod. That signifies that you have control over yourself. You're doing this, you know, you're learning all of these things, you're going to figure all of this out for yourself. And God said to Moses in this myth, take that rod and throw it on the ground. In other words, turn loose of it, don't control it. If you let go of yourself, you've heard that expression, let go, let God. Let go of the energy that flows up your spine. Let go of controlling your flow. And when Moses threw that rod on the ground, it became a serpent. Which means when he was no longer dependent on his self, the energy of kundalini was now free to rise itself up through the spine and impact on the pineal gland of the brain. And I'm not telling you something that's a Hindu thing. And you can read about it in that green book on the shelf in the back there. That's an anatomically correct thing. <coughs> the energy is an electrical energy which passes from the base of your spine up through the receptors of the spine, which are called chakras. And as you know, that uh, these, are, uh, these are resistors, and they resist the electrical energy that moves through them. And they have to be open for that energy to raise itself up to the pineal gland. Now, that's why it's so interesting, because in the ancient times, the people would all chant, Om, oh, Om, oh, you know, this energy would rise. And then we discover that, yes, indeed, they would chant Om, oh, because the international designation for the electrical resistance is Om, oh, O-H-M. That's a, called Ohm's Law in electrical knowledge. So, now, who, who knew that? I mean, this guy, that, Charlie Ohm or whatever that discovered this, discovered this in the 1700s. They were chanting Ohm for a thousand years. Because it's all, it's all written out for you. 
It's all there for you to discover. I, I, I get a kick out of saying it. If <laughs> the guy that discovered all his law was named Schwartz, the Buddhist for thousands of years would have been chanting, Schwartz. <laughs> Don't make any difference. So the rod is in the tabernacle, and as Revelation 5 1 says, the seven seals in the brain. See, there's a lot of people, especially in, the, in, in Christian circles, <coughs> that when they hear this kind of thing about the seven chakras and the spine and the right hemisphere of the brain and all of this stuff, and that this is Hindu or Buddhist and it's not good Christian stuff, but they're carrying it around in their own Bible. This is a Bible. It's not a Hindu, it's a King James Bible. This is the one they all use. Now, if, if you open it to 1,000, page 1,005 in that little <coughs> Bible that you had there, and you read exactly what I'm talking about, about the energy going up the spine and through the seven chakras in your Christian Bible, but they, I don't think they've ever seen it. How could they not see this? Or is it something they don't want to see? I don't know. You're on page 1005 in Revelation chapter 5. Look in verse 1. <laughs> and I saw it in the right hand. That's the right hemisphere of the brain. Of him that sat on the throne, that's the amen that dwells in the higher consciousness, a book. That's the book of life written where? Within. Within who? Within you. And on the back side, that's your spine, sealed with seven seals. Well, there it is. So what's the big, what are they freaking out about? What's the big problem? There it is. Okay? So the PM model of the brain is connected with the PM model of the spine. They're one. So we have to keep in mind that the temple is not just the brain. <laughs> but the temple includes the, the spine as well. Okay, the circle, the temple, whatever you want to call it. Now, here we go. In the uh, brain, as we know, we have dual models. We have the curtain, and we have Pia Mater. In the tabernacle, we have the holy place, when the priest goes in, we have the veil, and we have the most holy, where only the high priest can go in. The priest can't go in there. Okay. And what I want you to keep in mind is in your body, there is a tabernacle. In your brain, there is a place that nobody can get in. You can't get in. No human being can get in. <laughs> I'll show you a picture of it real quick. Uh, I don't want to dwell on it right now, but I'll show you uh, a picture of it on page 21 of the stuff I gave you. Okay? Page 21, <laughs> if you look right in the center, there's a thing called fornix which is the vault or the cave. And that is connected by something that goes to the left and the right side, the left and the right balance, which are the bright chambers. All right? <laughs> and if you'll find that the only thing that can get through there is a strange word called for amen. And if you remember Jesus Christ called himself amen. If you look on page... Uh, now, let's see. It's about page 19. I don't have it. Yeah, page 19. <clears throat> and if you look under perineum, and if you look down to the fourth sentence, you'll see connected by the four amen. So that, that vault, that cave, is four amen, and not for you, not for me. So it doesn't make any difference how hard you study. It doesn't make any difference. How many lectures you attend, it doesn't make any difference. How much you meditate, you're never, ever, ever going to get into the fornix. The fornix is the cave where Jesus was born, which you just celebrated on Christmas. The fornix is the tomb that Jesus was entombed in when the stone was rolled away. What is going to happen when the stone is rolled away from the fornix in your brain? What power is going to come out of there? That's what this whole thing is about. All right? But remember, neither you nor a guru nor any teachers can do anything about making that 
stone roll away about making that corn and soaking. That's four amen. And that will happen. Only the only thing that you're required to do is to get out of the way. You get out of the way and let the energy travel up your spine to the fornix, the stone will be rolled away, and then the power of Christ consciousness, Krishna consciousness, Buddha consciousness <coughs> will come in. So you're learning basically what this is all about. The fornix in your brain is that place. Nobody can go to that side. No human being can go to that side. Okay? Now, oh, I do? Oh, okay. Thanks. I didn't see you put that. Now let's take a look here so that we look and we understand it. Page 981. Hebrews chapter 9. And verse 6. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 6. <laughs> now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. <coughs> the first tabernacle, look up here, is Duramadi. That's the outer holy place. And the priest always went in there. Every day. See. Now, what about you? So what do you care about a priest or a minister? I mean, forget that. What about you? What, 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 what part do you play? Go to page, just hold your finger there. You've got nine pages. Go to page 991. And 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And verse 9. You are chosen a generation, a royal priesthood. And I, and I can get all the Christians to agree to this when they hear about you, because the next thing says, a holy nation, a peculiar people. They say, they are peculiar people. <laughs> Strange people. But anyhow, you're a priest. So what does that mean? You are allowed to go into the first tabernacle, which is Dura Mata, your brain. <laughs> and you go in there all the time. All the time. I'm out. I don't know if you're in there as much as I'm in. I'm, you're in there all the time. And you have all kinds of crazy people in there, wild things go on in there, strange, spooky things go on in there. But you know what? This is the neat part of it. You are the only one on the face of the earth that can go in to that tabernacle. Nobody else has ever been in there. But still, the PMI, the most holy place in your brain, even you can't get in there. You're not allowed in there. So you've got to do all of it. So what do you do? You come in here on Tuesday night, you go into meditation, you go into the first tabernacle. And you're, you're meditating for Aunt Susie, you're meditating because your foot hurts, you're meditating because you want to get money, you're meditating because people are sick, or you're just meditating for God, whatever, whatever it is. It's nobody's bill. I have no idea what goes on inside of your temple. The priest goes in there, that's you. So you have access, you have control. <laughs> you go in there all the time and you pray, you do all this stuff, but remember, every bit of the activity that's going on is happening in Dura Mater, it's happening in the holy place, the first tabernacle. But, Hebrews 9, 7, into the second, here's the second, Piamat, the most holy, the fortress. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood. The high priest alone is the only one that can go in to the holy place. You can't. So you can't go to any guru or any educational place and learn how to meditate to get... It never can happen. It's not your job, Mom. You can't do it. You can't... I mean, you, you can pray for the spring to come, but it's not your job. The sun and the sky, they'll take care of that. It'll come. What this means is there is a part of you <laughs> that is absolutely off limits to you and me. But there is something in you that will travel from deep down in the very basement of your being through the solar upwards to the pineal and then sit at the right hand where the fornix is and the stone will roll away. If you're right, all you've got to do is allow it to happen. Get out of the way. 
and allow the energy from below to rise up to sit at the right hand. And when you understand what's going on, and you get out of the way, this will occur. So this here is also the Garden of Eden. You remember when we talked the Garden of Eden? There's two things guarding the Garden of Eden, cherubim. The Garden of Eden located the east side, the right side. And the cherubim is the cerebrum. In other words, your brain is constructed so that not one bit of you or any of the kooky stuff that the preachers have ever told you is allowed to get into that right side. It is pure. It is virgin. It is unseen, just like the universe. Why? Because Pia Mater dwells there. Your holy mother dwells there. The high priest is Christ. Christ, the son. Now, here, you go in every day. You go in for your prayer. But look what it says here. The high priest went in once every year. Just once a year. Why? Why not every six months? Because it's a hidden mystery language. It's, a, it's, it's nature for God, you know, for all of these things that we need. We need to take care of all of these various things that are connected to what? Well, the high priest goes in once a year. How many months are in a year? Look on page seven of your stuff. <clears throat> when you and I go in, we got all of our nervous system as asunder with all of the different calamities that we experience. What is your latest calamity? We all have them. And if you haven't had a good calamity this week, you'll have one next week. <laughs> but there's a calamity waiting around the bend somewhere and you'll all be part of it. Some of you wind up at a doctor's. I need calamity pills. Got me something. I need a prescription, you know, for my calamity. Well, this is the way it is. So there are 12 nerves in your brain. When you go in, you've got to go in every day, every week, every month, and all of these different things are causing you all kinds of chaos. But the high priest, which is the Christ consciousness, which is the energy that rises up to the seven and impacts the pity, it enters in there and it touches them all at one time. It touches all twelve at one time. Sorry. The high priest energy <coughs> into the right side corrects the course one time. It's a movement for twelve. That's why, that's why this is so important. <clears throat> the important thing to understand is all that you ever are required to do in meditation is be still. Stop. What do you know about going into the fornix? Could you get into the fornix? You didn't even know until last week that you had a fornix. And you've had, how long are you? All of your life you're walking around with a fornix and you didn't even know it. And it's right in the middle of your head. It's closer. It's right. You don't. I have what? A fornix. And that's why God in the Bible said, do not intercourse with the strange woman who lives in the other place. Intercourse with Pia Mater, the virgin mother. Because when you're intercoursing with your emotional nature, on the left side, you're intercoursing with the strange woman. And you are not now into the fornix, you are into fornication. And fornix is the root of that word, fornication. And that's why it's used so freely in the Bible. <laughs> so that's where the energy and that's where the input has to be. Okay, now, notice something here. <coughs> <clears throat> in uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and, and, and verse 7, which is interesting. And it says here in verse nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 7, into the second, the high priest, once every year, not without blood. Not without blood. They used to sacrifice animals. That's what they did. 
And the same reason they sacrificed animals is the same reason that you have Jesus being born in a manger. The same reason they sacrificed animals is the same reason you have Jesus being crucified on a cross. You misinterpreted a truth, an astronomical fact, with a myth made up by men. And you misinterpreted it. And so for thousands of years, hundreds of years at least, that's what they did. They kill animals. They, there's still so many witches that do it today. They kill chickens. Some scuzzy guy did all these rotten things, and he said, I'll kill a chicken, and I'll take care of it. No, it won't. But why won't it? Because the stone is still stealing the forks. Now, <clears throat> okay, Christ, the high priest, cannot get into the holy place on the right side unless blood is shed. If you look at the stuff that I gave you on page 9, there's a, there's a uh, description by Stedman's Medical Dictionary of the word blood. And blood is, according to this, the circulating tissue of the body. I think we got the noise here. Could you get me another battery, please? That's all. The circulating tissue of the body, the fluid and its suspended form elements that are circulating through the heart, etc. <laughs> if you just bear with me for one second, we'll uh, change. So then, blood is your inner life force. Blood is your inner life force. Now, it's not, it's not right for me to stand here and tell you that there is no need to sacrifice blood, there is no need to kill animals, and so I should be able to document for you that I can prove. How can I prove that Jesus was not crucified, that blood didn't flow to satisfy some god somewhere. I mean, real blood. I mean, real, you know, just like when you bleed, real blood. This is the whole thing that the religion you followed all your life is based on. Go to page 942. <laughs> and in page 942, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse 50. Now I say this, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Then why, you say, why have you followed a religious cult that has told you all of your life that Jesus was crucified on a cross? Why? Why have they told that to you? It's the same reason that they killed animals, because they misinterpreted an astronomical fact. The reason that Jesus is called to be crucified on the cross is because on December the 21st, the shortest day of the year, when there is more darkness on the face of the earth than any other day, the sun enters a constellation called the cross. It's crucified. And on December the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, it is entombed in the bowels of the earth three days and three nights. It's called the winter solstice. That's a fact. And the sun is born out of the winter solstice on December the 25th. And from now on, every day, it'll get a little bit lighter. And they took this magnificent thing, which has to do with the solar plexus in you and the right hemisphere of your brain, and made it out to be that there's some God somewhere that cannot forgive people unless blood flows. You know what that is? That is blasphemy. And there is somebody, and I won't use the word, but it starts with P, and there's two S's, and it's somebody is ticked off up there. And we have no business to go into these places and subscribe to this type of blasphemy against God that God cannot forgive you without torturing people to death. And that whole picture was drawn because the sun must go through the cross. <coughs> if the sun did not go through the cross on December the 21st, you could not have spring in April. 
And if the sun does not go through the cross of the crucifixion within you in the meditation, you cannot have spring in your life. You cannot get out of the cold winter of your life. The sun cannot sit at the right side as it does in the universe. Now, the inner life force. And here, Paul says, flesh and blood can have no part of the kingdom of God. Now, where is the kingdom of God? Yeah, but that's, you're, you're right, but, but that's not good enough. Let's look at it. Look at the words. Where is it? Look, pay, here, here are two, there are two things that your religion has said in all of its existence <coughs> that are wrong. Number one, they said that Jesus is coming back to rule and reign on the earth. You see the preachers on TV all the time said, Jesus is coming and every knee shall bow. And, and, and we're all going to, and he's going to rule in his kingdom on the earth. But you know what Jesus says in the Bible? My kingdom is not of this world. Doesn't anybody pay attention to this guy? And he also said, you can't see me without the Jesus Christ in the Bible makes the statement that, that he just gave because you are told by your religious teachers that he will be seen and he's coming back for the second time. The inner life force, the blood, the kingdom of God. Okay, look at page 853. And look at Luke chapter 17. Now, if Jesus is coming and every eye is going to see him and every knee is going to bow, he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth, <laughs> why did he say this? Luke chapter 17, page 853, verse 21. Neither shall they say it's here or look it's there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And look at the, very, the, the verse right before that. The kingdom of God comes not with observation. You can't see it. This is the Bible that they've taught you. This time. Nobody ever said. And you know what? You're not allowed to get up and say, excuse me, pastor. Uh, you, that's, that's not what the guy said. Because they'll say you don't have any faith. And then you should say, I have no faith in you. You're right. But I have a lot of faith in the one who said these words because his words was that in me is the kingdom. And I cannot see this with the two eyes here, but if I practice the single eye, then I shall see. So, blood is a symbol of the inner conscious life force. How do we shed blood? How do we shed the inner life force so that the high priest can get into the holy temple? In other words, if you do not shed the inner life force, the high priest cannot go into the temple because the high priest cannot go into the holy place without the shedding of blood. So you have to shed the inner life force and then the high priest can go into the holy place or this whole deal is going to go south. Now how do you shed the inner life force? Go to page 782, Matthew chapter 6. Page 782, Matthew chapter 6. And in Matthew chapter 6, on page 782, <laughs> Jesus uses an ancient Eastern technique of teaching. If you're trying to make a point about a specific thing, you use numerology. In this particular case, Jesus is talking about your five senses, sight, taste, touch, smell, and hearing, that have to be turned off. That's your life force. They've got to be turned off. So he says in Matthew 6, okay, chapter tw uh, verse 25, take no thought. That's one. He says in Matthew 6, chapter 27, which of you by taking thought? That's two. He says in Matthew 6, 28, why take thought? That's three. He says in verse 31, take no thought. That's four. And he says in verse 34, take no thought. That's five. The five times there are the symbol of taking no thought for consciousness which will then bring you to that inner life force, which was the shedding of blood. The shedding of the inner life force occurs when you take no thought. It doesn't mean take no thought for your life because you are normally going to worry about your life. You're normally going to worry about your health. You're going to worry about your children. You're going to worry about your finances. These are normal things. But when you take no thought, you turn that life force that is the Christ force in 
side of you loose, okay? Now, wait a minute here. <laughs> that's the way we're interpreting this. That's the way I'm interpreting this, but that's not fair. Because maybe, maybe the blood that they took of animals, maybe they, they should have done that. I mean, we've we got to go a little further here. We're saying, well, flesh and blood, but still in all, maybe it's talking about animals, maybe you have to sacrifice. Now, let's make sure that what we're saying here is correct before we go any further, all right? Real quick with me and run with this, and I'm going to have to get out of here. Page 483, Psalm chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40 and verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears have you opened. Burnt offering and sin offering have you not required. In other words, somebody writing the Bible said, geez, I think I finally realized what this meant. Finally, I understand that you never required any kind of sacrifice. <laughs> and if there was no sacrifice required, it blows the whole thing about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's not required. The sacrifice of Jesus is the sun energy within you as we're describing. It has nothing whatsoever to do with God killing people or killing animals. Look at this. Page 489. <laughs> Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 16. For you desire not sacrifice, or I would do it. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. I mean, is that in the Bible? Do you, do you, is it in the Bible you're looking at? Now, where did it come from? Who made all of this stuff up? How is it possible? <laughs> Look. You know, look, look, what they, look what they do. Here, here you have a situation where in the temple they bring an animal in, blood all over the place. And they'd all go, hallelujah. And then you got Jesus on a... Let me tell you something. It's all... You know, I'm going to tell you it's consciousness, okay? Where was Jesus crucified? Golgotha. Golgotha. The word Golgotha means skull. Okay? Now, I'll tell you something else. Remember, the energy goes from the testicle or the testes, testimony, genital area, to the brain. Look at that stuff I gave you, a little closer, and you'll see it too. The word testy, testify, testicle. The word testa, skull. It is the same. Huh? Now, <coughs> so then we have this. Page, go to page 578. And page 578, Isaiah chapter 1. And we'll ask the question. Let's ask the question together. Okay? Isaiah chapter 1, look at verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? I'm full of this burnt off rams and blood bulls, goats. But look what he says in verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand? Another, who told you to do this? I want to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask myself the question. Who told you that God had to kill Jesus in order to forgive him? Who told you that God is not satisfied unless there's blood flowing? The same people that told you and misled you are the same people that told these and misled them. Religious. But when you start dwelling in this, God has got to crucify people, and God is going to come back in Armageddon, and all of this, excuse the expression, garbage. Remember this, remember this, remember this scripture too. Right where you're at. Verse 15, Isaiah 1. Hey, when you spread forth your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. And when you make many prayers, I'll not hear because your hands are full of blood. Not my hands, God says. God says, my hands are not full of blood. My hands cradle pussycats. My hands pet dolphins. My hands hold little children. My hands nurture roses and flowers and sweet things. But you have turned my holy place into a, into a, into a slaughterhouse. And now you've accused me who created you and created all good of torturing somebody to death so that I could forgive. 
and you wonder, did you ever wonder why you've been dropping bombs on each other all of your life? Have you ever wondered why there's all of these terrible diseases and cancers and why all of these things? Because we have taken God's holy place and turned it into a, into a, into a slaughterhouse. Our hands are filled with blood and we continue it. But it won't go on much longer. I guess we're just about done. So, why don't we wrap that? You know, I, I just, can you stay with me another three or four minutes? And I just want something, I just want to do one thing, and then, you know, just stay with me. Go to page 981, I don't know, right, but Hebrews chapter 9, where we're at, okay? Hebrews chapter 9, and verse 8. See, the point is, you, you've read this. Now, you've seen with your own eyes. I, I've shown you the Bible where, where God said these things. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. <laughs> the Holy Ghost signifying that the way into the holiest was not made manifest while the first tabernacle is still standing. You see what I'm saying to you? What is he saying to you? The way into the holiest, which is what your goal of life is, is not possible while you're still running around into the first one. You've got to realize that the first one is your temple to do all of your deals. That's not where the good stuff happens. It happens in the second one. You've got to shut down the first one. You've got to be still. You've got to be quiet. And as long as that first one is active, there's no way for the Christ in you to get into the second one. Read it again. The way into the holiest is not made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. How important is separating from thought, like Jesus instructed you? Without that, there's no movement of Christ in you. The door is sealed by cherubims, by cerebrum, by the activity of your brain. So all of this, dura mater, pia mater, arachnoid, cherubim, all of it is your brain. Your mind to find that secret door. All of these are symbols of the real thing. And the real thing is this temple which is dwelling on top of your shoulders. So religious symbols that we're talking about are just figures of the real thing. Tabernacle is your brain. Baptism and all of these things are just symbols. Did you know that? Did you know you had... Did you know you had no business being baptized? Why? Because you never knew what it was. And the guy who was baptizing you never knew what it was. What did they do? They put you in water. And what happened? You got wet. <laughs> and that's supposed to turn on some guy. I don't care if they sprinkle you or they poured booze on your head. You still got wet. <laughs> Look. Real quick. This is baptism. There are five stages of consciousness in Greek. Number one is earth. That's your head. The second stage of consciousness is water. Okay? That's a higher level of consciousness. That's meditation. The third stage of consciousness is air. That's where there is no thought. The fourth stage of consciousness is fire. That's where the spirit so when you go into meditation with your head, you rise to the second stage, you touch water. You then go up into the third stage, which is air, where there is no thought. That's why it says in the Bible, we will rise to meet Jesus in the air. And then you are touched by fire or the Spirit. Remember when Jesus in the, in the myth rose out of the water, the dove came down, which is a symbol of the Spirit. So that's when, you're, that's when you're baptized. You shouldn't be baptized in water. You don't have to have people, unless they're chiropractors or whatever, laying hands on you. Now, do I have a right to tell you that? I mean, all I have is this book. I don't have anything else. There's nothing. I mean, all of these stories are not confirmed anywhere but in this book. So, you know, I'll just do this one other thing and then I promise you. But just do this with me. Go to page 979. And look what it says in Hebrews chapter 6. And verse 1, you have to see it with your own eyes or I have no business telling it to you. It says there, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. What? Have you ever heard anybody in a church? Leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Go on to perfection. 
not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. I mean, don't all of these rules and regulations or faith towards God. You know why you have to have faith in God? Because you're not sure. How many of you have shoes on? <laughs> not one of you can see your foot. Do you have to have faith that it's in there or do you know? I hope you know. Why? Because it's a part of you. It's alive. It moves. It feels. That's it. You don't have to have faith. You only have to have faith in something you're not sure of. And look what he says here. Not laying in the foundation of baptisms, laying out of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. They're all symbols. He says, get away from all of that stuff. In the Bible. <laughs> now, this is where we finish for today. Hebrews chapter 9. And next week, if you're here, we enter the third ventricle. <laughs> the third ventricle. But this is important because it says in the construction of the temple that they went up with winding stairs to the middle chamber, which is the fornix, and then out of the middle into the third. And if you remember, the apostle Paul said when he was hit over the head with something, he says, I was transported to the third heaven. It's the third ventricle. And this is the place where the bridal chamber is, where the fornix is. We go in there next week where the labyrinth really gets heavy. Okay, this is it for now, though. Hebrews chapter 9. Page 981. Now, this is what I've been telling you about all of the symbolisms that were in the Bible of the old tabernacle, of the old temple. Look what he says, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 9. Okay? <laughs> well, let's read 8. The Holy Ghost signified that the way into the holiest was not made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Okay? Now, watch this. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered gifts and sacrifices, church, religion, that could not make him that did the surface perfect as pertaining to the conscience. As pertaining to the mind. And you know that. You went to church all of your life and your mind was a zoo. I know. But what we're happening here, we're understanding now, is how this very mind that you have can submit and become perfection. I don't care if Dura is perfect, because I know Pia is perfect. And I know as chrism, which is the oil, rises up, moves to the right side, the stone will be rolled away and the power will come pouring out into that which is the mind, into that which is the soul, into that which is our very being, the oneness with Christ. So this basically then is how it works. And as I said, next week we, we'll enter into the third ventricle and then we really get into some deep stuff. We've just been, we've been hanging out in the lobby for the last couple of weeks. And next week we're going to go right in the middle of it, right in the middle of your head. We're going to look with nooks and crannies and all the little winding stairs and dark hallways and subterranean things where all this stuff goes on and find out that, indeed, it is only for amen. Okay? See ya. Bye-bye.